You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, Episode 25, Sonnet 24. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say I'm not just another not one in your place? place? You're the pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? This has been another late episode, a fact of which I'm not proud. And this one is late for two reasons. The first is that I've once again had to migrate the comic website. This time because after receiving the illustrator's sketch for page 3, I've remembered that the comic's introduction to Narcissus and Echo will be dealing with some very adult themes that violate bloggers' content policies. So I've now reconstructed the site using WordPress and flagged it as mature. The good news is that the WordPress version looks a lot better. I've also replaced page 2 with the correct version which has a black border, which I recommend taking a look at. The sketch for page 3 is available exclusively for my patrons on patreon.com. The address for the website is proving a bit problematic because I'm not prepared to pay for a WordPress membership out of funds that are intended for the graphic novel, but I'll deal with that in due course. In the meanwhile, sonnetcomics.com should direct you to the WordPress site. The second reason for this being another late episode is that I've learned the hard way that I am not the right person to teach my son to skateboard, and I've ended up with a painful knee injury that's made it very difficult to be productive this week, so please bear with me. On another note, I have to admit that I'm still entertained and amused by the fact that the previous podcast episode analyzing Sonnet 23 was by far the longest episode yet. One thing that I noticed but didn't look deeper into is the spelling of the word eyes in the original text. If you recall my comments on the word eyes from the second episode, I introduced the first sonnet with a quote from Sonnet 24, not realizing that what I was saying was borne out by a distinct difference of the original text spelling of the word eyes, as alternating between E-Y-E-S and E-I-E-S, reinforcing my reading of the word eyes as meaning multiple instances of me, in addition to the usual interpretations of physical eyes, metaphorical stars, and windows to the soul. Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and as importantly, for showing faith in a project I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support the graphic novel adaptation at www.patreon.com slash Fisher King. Every dollar helps breed a page that brings us closer to a beautiful graphic novel that will make the sonnets so much more accessible. And of course, ten times that dollar will bring you the finished product ten times faster. Sonnet 24 Mine eye hath played the painter and hath steeled Thy beauty's form in table of my heart. My body is the frame wherein tis held and perspective it is best painter's art. For through the painter must you see his skill, to find where your true image pictured lies, which in my bosom's shop is hanging still, that hath his windows glazed with thine eyes. Now see what good turns eyes for eyes have done, mine eyes have drawn thy shape, and thine for me, are windows to my breast, where through the sun delights to peep, to gaze therein on thee. Yet eyes this cunning want to grace their art. They draw but what they see, know not the heart. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 24. Before I begin, I feel obligated to draw attention to the number 24, which I feel certain should be important, considering that there are 24 hours in a day. That's all I really have to go on, though, but I'm hoping something will surface at some point. Mine eye hath played the painter and hath steeled thy beauty's form in table of my heart. My body is the frame wherein tis held, and perspective it is best painter's art. It intrigues me that Shakespeare's direct references to plays and acting appear so sparingly in the sonnet sequence. This is the second appearance out of seven of the word play. Stage appears twice, and the word actor only once, that being in the previous sonnet. So sonnet 24 begins as a continuation of sonnet 23's acting metaphor with Mine eye hath played, and after the previous sonnet introduced the idea of hearing with eyes, 
we now have a sonnet in which the eye is playing the role of a painter, suggesting that the eye is Sonnet 23's unperfect actor and that the image it captures must be translated into words in order to be expressed well. Painter, in Middle English, meant both an artist who paints pictures and a rope or chain that holds an anchor to a ship's side. The verb steeled originated in the 1580s and meant make hard or strong like steel. Aside from the relatively straightforward reading of this line, we can also see it tie in to the established sailing theme. Table was a loaded term, meaning piece of furniture with a flat top and legs, board, slab, plate, writing tablet or gaming table, and most interestingly, arrangement of numbers or other figures on a tabular surface for convenience. The word table appears only three times in the sonnet sequence, and whereas here the table is of my heart, in sonnet 122 the tables are within my brain. In Old English, body meant trunk of a man or beast, physical structure of a human or animal, material frame, material existence of a human, main or principal part of anything and it maintained most of its meaning through to Shakespeare's day, by which it had picked up the additional meaning of any number of individuals spoken of collectively. As the 154 sonnets are spoken of and for collectively, it seems that this last meaning is quite apt. Frames meaning of border or case for a picture or pane of glass only originated half a century after Shakespeare's death, but in his day it included a structure composed according to a plan, enclosing border and profit, benefit or advancement, all of which can refer to the sonnet sequence following the established themes. Perspective meant the science of optics and the art of drawing objects so as to give appearance of distance or depth. In the Arden sonnets, Catherine Duncan Jones suggests that this might be a reference to perspective glass an optical instrument for seeing things not accessible to normal view. But I've had a hard time corroborating that, as the only mentions of perspective glass I've found are from after the year that the sonnets were first published. There are a number of ways of reading the word best in It is Best Painter's Art, but I believe that the key to reading it correctly is in the capitalization of the word painter, which is not capitalized in the first line. This suggests that Shakespeare's eye the sonnet, is playing the role of a painter, and when in that role, is referred to by the proper noun, painter, although of course painter could also refer to Shakespeare himself. With this in mind, best painter's art has the word best describing painter, and so perspective, the art of creating the illusion of the depth of Shakespeare's spirit, is the art of best painter. In the first quatrain, then, the sonnet sequence appears to be speaking to Shakespeare, saying, This sonnet has taken on the role of painter, and has reinforced the memory of Shakespeare's form in the arrangement of its pages. The majority of the sonnet text is the frame in which Shakespeare's memory is held, and creating the illusion of the depth of Shakespeare's spirit is its art. For through the painter must you see his skill, to find where your true image pictured lies, which in my bosom's shop is hanging still, that hath his windows glazed with thine eyes. In addition to ability and cleverness, skill also meant power of discernment. As noted in the Arden sonnets, through the painter means both by means of the painter and, more literally, through the painter poet, whose eye is transparent. In this case, the skill of Shakespeare was in painting words, and only through them can we see what he was truly made of. Image is the second word to be capitalized in Sonnet 24, and meant artificial representation that looks like a person or thing, and reflection in a mirror. As these reflections of Shakespeare are imbued with their own perspectives and personalities, it makes sense that they would be identified by proper nouns. The true image, of course, is Shakespeare, but it is also possible to read lines 5 and 6 as saying, if you want to find the image of yourself, the reader, that Shakespeare imagined, you must see it through his art. Considering the distinction between the you and your of these two lines and the thee and thou of the rest of the sonnet, 
this appears to be a viable reading. As today, lie meant both rest and speak falsely. So, to find where your true image pictured lies reads, find where the real image of Shakespeare rests, as well as find where the true image that's portrayed is untruthful, which takes us back to Sonnet 17, which discusses manipulating the truth in order to seem truthful, and reminding us that Sonnets 23 and 24 are about acting, or pretending to be something one is not. Bosom meant breast, womb, surface, ship's hold, and shop meant workshop. Since the first sonnets, I have suggested that the pages of the sonnets are wombs in which Shakespeare plants the seeds of his imagination. Shakespeare's bosom's shop would be the place where he manufactured his emotions and imagination. Each sonnet's text is a shop that produces images for the reader. A ship's hold would be the second sailing reference of this sonnet and it would be the right place for Shakespeare to store his treasure. Hanging still is interesting because aside from the image evoked of a picture hanging in a workshop, it also evokes an image of a man hanging from the gallows. Either way, the image will last forever as it has been captured in the text of the sonnet and stored on the eternal page, which is Shakespeare's workshop. I don't know why I even bothered to look up the word window, but I'm surprised to discover that it originated from the Old Norse wind eye and replaced the Old English eye hole and eye door. Originally it meant an unglazed hole in a roof, so being able to read this line as that has his unglazed holes glazed with your eyes makes it very interesting indeed, even more so when considering that wind and breath are mentioned frequently throughout the sequence as the reader is supposed to be lending their breath to the sonnets as they read out loud. So a window or wind eye has even more validation as referring to a sonnet. As glaze meant to fit with glass, and glass is used in the sequence to refer to the sonnet mirror that reflects Shakespeare's image, as well as the glassy spring in which Narcissus sees himself, we can now read this last line as my breast, which has windows made up of my eyes. Now see what good turns eyes for eyes have done. Mine eyes have drawn thy shape, and thine for me are windows to my breast where through the sun delights to peep, to gaze therein on thee. The third quatrain brings all the conceits of the first two quatrains together. Good turns might refer to page turns, and it's important to note that the spelling of the two eyes in the original quarto text are different. As I mentioned before, E-Y-E-S appears to refer to Shakespeare's and the reader's eyes, whereas E-I-E-S would refer to the sonnets. I've scanned through the original quarto text of the sonnet sequence, and out of the 14 times the word sun, S-U-N, appears, it is capitalized 10 times, whereas of the three times sun, S-O-N, appears, it is only capitalized once. I am confident this is for emphasis, though precisely the intention behind the emphasis is difficult to ascertain, but I strongly suspect that it is to differentiate between the regular use of those words from when they refer to Hamnet and the sonnets. The sun could also refer to Shakespeare's creative strength and power, or the light that pours onto the page whenever the reader opens the book of sonnets. Peep meant a glance through a small opening. With Shakespeare speaking to the sonnets, he is saying that his eyes have done the sonnets favors, drawing their shape, and for Shakespeare, the sonnets are windows to Shakespeare's breast, through which the sun looks back out to see the sonnets. If he is speaking to the reader, then he is saying that his eyes have drawn the reader's shape, and the reader's eyes are windows to his soul, windows through which Hamnet, or the sonnets, delight to look back out of and into the reader's. Yet eyes this cunning want to grace their art. They draw but what they see, know not the heart. The Arden Sonnets introduces Sonnet 24 by saying, By looking closely into the speaker's eye, the young man can see a perfect image of himself, his own eyes being like a glass window, but he cannot see how much the poet loves him. And for lines 11 and 12, it says, The son in love with the young man, enjoys gazing out of his eyes and into those of the poet, in order to see the youth's reflected image. Behind the conceit lies the notion that the speaker loves the young man so much that 
the sun shines out of his eyes. There may also be a side glance at the youth's role as son, not father, as in sonnets 1 to 17. These comments amaze me, and the reason for my amazement is that, like in so many other instances, they touch so remarkably close to home, but still, somehow, fail to come together and actually make it there. In Sonnet 24, what we have is the sonnet, which is Shakespeare's eye, capturing Shakespeare's beautiful form and framing its essence. Through the words of the sonnet, you can see Shakespeare's artistic ability, which more than any picture is where his true representation lies. These words remain on display on this page in the bosom of the sonnet sequence, and these pages are like windows glazed with the reader's eyes. Now see how the sonnets and the reader's eyes compensate one another. Shakespeare has drawn the sonnet's shape, and the sonnets serve as the windows to his soul through which the reader's eyes delight to look in, and through which the memory of Hamnet looks out. But for all this, the reader's eyes take in only what they see, and the image they paint in their hearts could never be quite the same as the inner workings of the bard's mind. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com and join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnetcomics with an x. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not no, like I'm the yet. others? What, what if I say I'm not just another no, one in your place? You're, you're the, the pretender. pretender. What, what if I say I will never surrender? surrender.